Ken, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for having me. Well, I am excited about this one. Uh, you know, uh, before we're talking, you were, you've been doing this business for almost 26 years. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of experience in that, a lot of good, bad, and the uglies along the way, I'm sure. Uh, but for everybody that's new that's listening, can you give us a, a little be- background of, of your company and who Ken is? Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, the managing member here at KRI Partners. It's a company I started back in 19, 1997. So to take it even before that, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. Nobody knows where Toledo is unless you've watched MASH. Then you probably know Max Klinger and uh, Mr. Tony Paco's hot dogs. That might ring a, a bell for some of your listeners. There it is. But then uh, after I got my undergrad from Toledo, then I moved to Cleveland, got my master's degree from a place called Case Western Reserve, a small private school. And that is where I became a CPA. I'm sorry. I was a commercial lender while I went to school. I spent five years at a bank being a, a commercial lender. And then uh, after that, I'd had enough of that. So uh, I went to work for Deloitte, uh, became a CPA on the tax side, actually did some cool work. I mean, I I did a lot of private equity work, did a lot of M&A, due diligence, ta- tax planning, you know, a lot of stuff that, you know, fast forward 26 years, it really was helpful. Um, I didn't understand it at the time, but it, it has proven to be very, very helpful. But it was there that I really decided to change my life. What it, some people have probably heard the story, but, you know, my family was really young, right? I, I'm not quite as young as you might think. Um, my kids were, my daughter in particular was uh, an infant. She had just been born. I did her middle of the night feeding and I love that. That was really cool because I got to spend that time with her, right? If you're a, if you have a daughter, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly. It's great father-daughter time. Problem was after a while, I got frustrated because remember I'm working at Deloitte at the time, working 80 hours a week. And this is the best I could do three in the morning, her middle of the night feeding. I'm like, man, this isn't like, this isn't, this isn't working. Like I thought I did everything I was supposed to do, but here I am. The best I can do is 3 a.m. with my daughter. Yeah. So I decided I had to make a change. Back then, yeah, I'm going to date myself. You ever heard of Carlton Sheets? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. That's, that was the first real, that was the only thing out there. And so I bought that program. That was all about single family houses. So it kind of helped, but it kind of didn't, it, you know, it got me motivated because Carlton always showed off his nice home and, and stuff in Florida. But so after three years of just trying to figure this thing out, I did end up buying three small properties, like 24, 28, 22 unit properties, very small properties, sold them in three years, made half a million bucks. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. What just happened to me here, right? Uh, You know, that night I was sitting there with my daughter trying to come up with a plan to how to get out of the rat race, right? And uh, so I put the plan together and and it actually worked. I'm like, wow, this is cool. So I just made half a million on the side, on the side. I made more money on the side than I did the whole time I was at Deloitte. Yeah. And I said, you know what, this, I got to pursue this. I got to continue to do when this. When your business. side hustle becomes your main hustle. It did. That's exactly right. That's the beauty. I got to start it slow and steady and learn while I still had the safety net of this, you know, 80 hour week job. Uh, and then it was the right time that I jumped ship. And uh, now this is, this is all I do. Fast forward, you know, I got to spend tons of time with my kids. I never miss their baseball games, their basketball games. I got to travel all over with my daughter in her AAU program. Never could have done that if I was at Deloitte. No way. No way. No chance. So uh, mission accomplished. And, uh, you know, fast forward 25 years, been very, very successful. And and uh, here I am. Ken, we both share a little bit of the same story. I started in 2005, right, is when I got into real estate. I started off, I did single family for a bit and then transitioned to apartments in 2011. But like you, though, uh, I mean, I have two kids. Now they're out of the, oh, one is a senior in high school, but mm-hmm. I was their coach. I got to do everything. And it's yep. the beauty of this business when done right. Uh, it can give you everything, time and money, right? You have both, right? So what is it? Uh, so where are you at now? Because I know you've done quite a few successful deals all the way through. And uh, and then you still own and operate as well. So Tell us, let's get us into the weeds a little bit of that. Yeah, so so it was, I'm trying to think, the first deal, the first 10 years, we really did this with our own money. Yeah. And it was hard uh, in Cleveland, very, a lot of leverage, you know, a lot of risk, more risk than I would take with outside investor money. Um, I think it was 2004, something like that. We decided to start uh, syndicating, uh, syndicated our first deal. It was the only one we syndicated in Cleveland. 
fast forward now in Florida, we've syndicated multiple deals. We now do blind pool funds as a way to be more competitive. We've probably raised $40 million. We have about 35 or 40 employees that work for us. You know, we're vertically integrated. So unlike many, we we want to manage our own stuff because we think we can do it better. I and, do the same uh, thing for the same reasons, right? Do you really? Absolutely. Oh, that, yeah. That. Yeah. We vertically integrated a, actually this year. This is uh well, 2023, best move I've ever made. Yes. I said I would never do it. I know. And then once I did, I was like, God, why did I do this sooner? I know. I know. Nobody is gonna run your property better than you. They yeah. just won't. They just won't because they don't have that same incentive you do, right? So we have always We're not focused on the same goals. The goals don't align, right? With property management right. and uh, and your goals as an owner, they're totally opposite. I know. No, you're right. And so I grew up not knowing how to do third party management. You know, I never. Well, remember in Cleveland, there were nobody invested in Cleveland from outside of Cleveland. So right. there was no reason. <laughs> I know that's kind of funny, but it's true. So because of that, there was never a third party management business. It just never grew up. And right. so when I went to Florida, uh, we, we've done some third party management in Florida, right? But it was just a no brainer. Everybody else was hiring third parties and I just couldn't even imagine doing it. Yeah. Why would you do that? Right. No yeah. Right. I had solved so many of the problems. Why do I want to go hire someone else so I could teach them? And what do you think the biggest problem is just for everybody listening? What do you think the biggest problem when it comes to that third party platform? Yeah. I mean, it's, this is very insightful, kind of nuancy, right? But if you think about a vendor, they're a vendor of yours. And what I've what I watch happen, and and I, I know this because we've done third party management. There's this ceiling of information. There's this block of information that doesn't get up to the ownership group, and it's because it is a concern about being being fired, right? If something's not going right, they're not going to really share with you the real deal. You'll never. What if really they know. know? What if they know? Right? Yeah. Don't let them know. Don't tell them this. Yeah, I don't. Yes, I think sometimes it's subconscious. I mean, it's built. I don't think they do it on purpose, but I think you're right, yeah. though. Uh, information comes in, but it's not a highway that goes back and forth. It's right. It's a big freeway that turns into a one lane road. And that's all that can travel. Right, right. So the the biggest nightmare for a third party manager is the owner talking directly to the person in the office. The staff. That makes them mental. Ooh. That makes them mental. They that scares the hell out of them with good reason. Well, because sometimes owners don't know what they're doing, right? So right. it is kind of torturous. But if you are an owner that knows what, what they're doing, see, when I have to solve a problem, I get everybody involved. And everybody's happy. No, they're probably not happy to talk to me. But the point is that we get them all together from the ground all the way up. And I will tell you that some of the best solutions to problems we have had have come from the leasing person, from the, yeah. the property manager on site. The maintenance guy is like, I don't know why we're doing this. We're like, wait a minute. Tell me what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, boom, the problem is solved. And in the third party world, you wouldn't get that. That is I think some of the biggest problems, and then you're just talking about people who don't take ownership, right? Because it's not their- Of the expense side of the equation, right? So they'll take ownership of the income side because that's how they get paid. Right. Um, and But that NOI thing is like, wait a second, uh, we'll spend you to death because it doesn't really matter. It's not our money. We're going to get it's paid- It's not our fault this. something broke, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah oh right. yeah, we just, uh, we spent- Twenty thousand dollars on snow removal, even though uh, you know the other property spent five. You know, it's, right? Oh well, you know, uh, we'll, we'll you know yeah. ask for forgiveness, and that's what I see a lot of times is that yeah. the yeah. Uh, alignment of interest in the NOI profitability doesn't always match up exactly with the owners. And, and, but I, and I think Ken, you're absolutely right. Is when there's issues at properties. I'm thinking about when I well, I have a property right now that we're. Uh, we just experienced we're ha we're having this our washing dryers are failing and it's this one little board right we're like and it's like 25 bucks or 20 bucks or something like that we're like maybe we should start buying hey, hey let's get all these in stock and maybe we should start proactively replacing them now there and, you go. Uh, and and just be a little proactive about it so they don't yeah. go boom and it, it's a preventive maintenance tip and they're like i think this is what we need to do we're like you're right let's let's go ahead and order a bunch of those and Let's just, you know, a monthly on a monthly basis, we'll install this many and this many so it doesn't kill our PL, but we're gonna prolong everything that needs to get done. 
Now, now That's having said, having beat up third-party managers for a minute, I'm going to defend them because yeah. I want to make this point because this is important because I've been a third-party manager. Yep. Um, think about a CPA doing a tax return, right? Do you ever call your CPA and just, man, that is the best tax return I have ever seen in my life. You did an amazing job. You never do that. You'll never make that phone call. But no. if they screw something up, you're going to definitely call them, right? So there's no upside and tons of downside. That's what third-party management is. It is a thankless job. No one ever calls you and says, to the third-party manager says, you guys are amazing. You're better than sliced bread. I love you. I mean, they can do 99,000 things right, and you will focus on the two things they didn't do right. It is a very challenging job. So I just wanted to make that point because there's probably a lot of third-party managers maybe listening, and I, you know, I just want everybody to realize Amen it is very to that, right? difficult. And for time. the longest time, it works, right? So for me, it worked until it didn't, right? And then so you, you realize it is a thinkless job. It They will never be, uh, and there's not a lot of margins in that either. So no, honestly, no, there's so, not. So it's, like I don't manage my properties to make money. I manage it to make money profit for my assets. But right. uh, the property management side kind of breaks even. Like I just spend all my money that I make and fees mm -hmm. to buy staff. That's right. Yeah. Right? And make a yeah. little small income, but like mainly it, it provides staffing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, so you talked a little bit earlier about how you went from uh, kind of doing all your own deals to then finally uh, creating a fund. I did. A yeah. blind pool fund. Let's talk about that because I don't think that there's enough people that understand why, but and, and and why, why, why would you go fund route than doing a single deal entity yeah. by itself? Yeah, so um, I, I'm going to just review both because it's important to understand why we made the transition. Yeah. So with the first of all, we buy in a very competitive markets, right? That we're in growth markets: Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, Bradenton, all over Florida and the Southeast. Well, when we go after a deal, so is ten or fifteen other people. They're you know we're competing with ten or fifteen LOIs, and we've got to set ourselves apart. So in the syndication route, we're going to go find the deal. We're going to convince the broker to give it to us, probably by price, because how, what else? How else are they going to differentiate us? And then we got to run around like crazy people to try to raise the money in about forty-five days. It is really challenging and very difficult to do. Now, a number of years ago, we said, "Wait a minute, I, I'm I'm tired of paying up for these deals, right? I mean, Florida's okay. you'll grow out of overpaying a little bit, but boy, it sure would be nice." to really have a leg up on, on, on the buy side. So we did the blind pool fund. All that means is we go out and raise the money first. Then we go to the broker community. Hey, we've raised 10, 15, $20 million, whatever it is. We need to deploy this, mo this money. And I will tell you the very first fund we did, we did three deals in that fund. First deal never saw the market. And the second and third deal we got, we were not the highest bidders, but we got because of the certainty of close thing. So we proved that that model works. Now, the reason that people don't do it is it's harder to raise money. Because if I'm talking to you to be a prospective investor, I don't have this beautiful building to show you. I have the beautiful buildings I've done before, right? You're by, I mean, you really are trusting the sponsor no matter what. Because you just are right. Photo pictures could be photoshopped. It and really is that way. Yes, I agree. It is very difficult without a lot of experience. Without track raise. That's exactly right. Yeah, we just wrapped up a raise uh, on a fund. It was fifteen million, and it it's a lot of work, right? It, it just is because you know, people. What happens is after you develop the trust, it's just like anything. It grows organically. And once you've delivered, you know, we've gone full cycle on about 13 deals. But once you've done that over and over and over, as you know, people start to believe it. You know what? I think these guys know what they're doing. I'd be willing to give, I would be the willing to give money. Yeah, they want to give you more money and the referral train really starts to open up. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I think that's a good analogy too. I think um, I think when you're first starting out, sometimes it's it's really easy to do that first syndication deal on its own because you'll probably need the track record of the deal you yeah. may or may not overpay you're not going to have as much leverage but at the same time um you know right now is a good time to be in the marketplace because uh the contracts are not like they were a year and a half ago right like right. last year a year and a half ago it was nuts yes. all this earnest pre-look all this craziness 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You had to go hard on day one, and they give oh you the my God. agreement. And yeah, those days are over, thank God. So I'm like, I don't have to do that anymore. But like, let's just do normal contracts. But yeah, um, there was a point in time where it was a little bit nuts. And for uh, someone doing a syndication, that 45 day window, because normally you want at least a 90 day window, 45 days to go under contract, do due, due diligence, and another 45 days to close. That would be uh, that's how we try to structure our deals, but and not not yeah. that it always happens, but like right. But there's that button of surety of close when you can say, "Here's my dump chunk of money." What do you think, Mister Broker? Mm -hmm. And like you like to think that it's fair, but it's not fair. It's totally unfair when it comes to brokers and relationships. Wouldn't you think, Ken? It it is yes, yes. The relationships we have with our brokers is is extremely valuable, right? We we promise them, I make a commitment to them. Number one, this will be the easiest deal you ever did. Number two, we're not going to retrade you for some nonsense. Stupid number crap. three, if I write you an LOI at a number, we're going to close at that number, unless there's something really is Something complete. really is wrong. We're not going to go ticky tacky. You know, we, we just don't throw out LOIs knowing full well, we're going to try to retrade 20, 25%. And, and the brokers know that. And yeah. then I tell them, here's the kicker. As long as you don't completely destroy our relationship, you're getting it on the turn. Yeah. That matters. That yes, matters. I want it back again when you go to sell it. That's exactly right. So look, loyalty these is based people. on that, right? Pardon me? That's a that's loyalty. You're buying loyalty. They're like, wait, this guy was easy to work with. He did what he said he was going to do. <laughs> and then he's going to give me more business in the future. I'm all in. <laughs> Hold on. I got a new deal. Before I even list it, who do I call? No, you're you're right. I mean, think about it. these are people. I'm calling trying my to friends. Make a living just like you are. They're no different. Yeah. And being on the third party management side, we actually got to spend time with them in a different way. So when you're helping them get a deal done, when they can refer you in as a third party manager, knowing you're going to take care of their their client, run the property well, it's going to be successful. Then they then it's a whole happy transaction and then they get to sell it. See, yeah. we get to see them at a different level, right? It's yeah. it's easier to stand next to somebody. You just develop a different relationship. But I mean, these brokers, they get abused. I mean, they just do. And when they find someone who's not just trying to set them up and abuse them and, and the last minute, well, oh, I'm walking away unless you have your fee. I mean, people yeah. do nasty things to them. I, it drives me nuts. And they work for free. Everybody forgets this. They're working for free until you close. So yeah. they look at you as like, is this guy going to give me my paycheck? And, I, and is it going to be a paycheck? Like, oh, God, that was great. Or is it going to be like, God, I, I worked every bit for that one. And they're like, oh, my God, that was like a nightmare horror story movie that I don't ever want mm -hmm. to watch again. And so you get to decide what kind of um, person you're going to be. But I'm just going to tell you what Ken's talking about is the way to do it you attract it with honey do what you say you're going to do have integrity show up and thank them take them to lunch take them to dinner right. instead of them sending you stuff when you close how about you send them something right it doesn't Just happen very often, people, by the way they people yeah. they have families there they work their ass off so yeah they yeah. absolutely do and but it is an unfair advantage i talk about this many times on my podcast that guys if you want to change the loving field, get to know those brokers in such a way that you know about their kids, their family, their golf, anything that they find important, make it about them. They will start feed you deals because they, they, you developed a relationship. Right. And, and, and then, and then, you know, as long as you go and transact and close in front of them, you have just reached a different hierarchy and that'll feed you for the rest of your life. It doesn't take, but three or four brokers can, don't you think to, to feed you for the rest of your life? Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, we have more than three or four relationships. But yeah, yeah, especially in markets like Florida, the competitive markets, they if you don't think that they control who gets that deal, you're crazy because they yeah. do. Yeah, they do. And if you don't think they don't talk, you're crazy. They, they do. do. Yep. They do. I mean, you screw one guy, you might as well have screwed every single one of them because they're all going to know about it. Yeah. What other trade uh, shows or trade groups do you go to? Do you, do you go to... Um... Oh, I don't think you know what's uh NMHC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there. I didn't go to San Diego this year. I like to stay in these two the <laughs> easier travel. 
but uh, I think it's out west now, kind of permanently, is the word on the street. So yeah, I'll it's be close to. It out there I live in Phoenix, so it's close. So I was like, oh, it's a quick roll fly to yeah. San Diego or Vegas, or whatever it is that. So that's where you find a lot of those brokers too. Though that's where they go out and they all get the shop talk uh, talk shop, and those are, those are good ones to go to, I think. But um, at the end of the day, it's really about just doing what you're saying you're going to do, and it doesn't ha- it doesn't hurt to have like Ken has a dump truck of money. <laughs> sitting right in front of their face, right? Like, I got this money. I need to spend it. I'm looking for this, right? Now, do you help coach them, Ken, on what you're looking for? Oh, sure. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, over time, they know what we like and what we don't like. And they just don't bother showing us stuff that they know there's no chance I'm going to like. And And I do appreciate that because, you know, they're not wasting my time. Exactly. Right. And they're not wasting their time because they know there's no chance. And with us, it's the biggest thing brokers try to cram down your throat is, if anything, it's it's neighborhoods, yeah, and markets that we just don't go to, the you know the marginal neighborhoods the because the third, the, third the, tr- 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 the smallest small you're like no no because there's no well, other not the buyers small. here right. It's- it's not the small that bothers me so much as when there's crime and things like that. Yeah, the that, undesirable that, neighborhoods. That, yeah. Yeah, been there, done that. Is no fun. It's very difficult. We just won't do it anymore. You know, it's so. funny. I look at my investing portfolio too. I, I like when I first started, I'd buy almost anything, right? Like nineteen <laughs> sixties, no problem. I'll rehab that. I'll put all that effort into it. And now, as I'm, I've gotten a little bit older, I'm like, I kind of want something built in two thousands. <laughs> I kind of, yeah. kind of want something Maybe a little bit newer. Nineteen thirties product. Yeah. You know, and I think, and the really, I think it comes down to raising capital. If I really was to put my, why am I buying, nine, you know, like, hey, because I can, I can, I know how to raise capital now. And yep. I think that's, I kind of, that's the story that I see a lot of syndicators migrate to is when they first start, you know, raising a two couple million dollars, that may all be, that's it, right? That's, that's it. I'm all in. Mm-hmm. But like you said, Ken, capital starts to snowball. You do it long enough, you make enough people happy. Mm-hmm. You'll be able to trade up to bigger, nicer apartments, and and those are tend to be a little bit easier to manage and operate. Where you're they not do. trying to yeah. collect is you know you're not chasing everybody for rent; they're already conditioned to pay rent. Right, right. They, right? Yeah, they, that's right. Yeah. What's the future look like for you, Ken? The future. So we're we're just going to continue to uh, do what we're doing, rinse and repeat. Right. Continue to to grow our firm. You know, we we have an amazing team. That you know we've we've structured our company so that we benefit our team benefits our investors benefit, and it really is rewarding. the The other side of our future is really now now that I've been doing this for 25, 26 years, watching new people get into the business, and just watching them not do very well because they don't have a good place to learn. So we've actually rolled out an entire investor education side of our business that is not, you know, a high level investor education. It's not, you know, a money grab. This is, we do, we have an underwriting course that we take you through our process, the details, the one that we've used for, you know, 26 years. And we teach you exactly how to do it. We give you our spreadsheets, the one we use every day, that kind of stuff. So we have now really focused on that because what I find happen, there's always a lot of reasons I do things. Yeah. The first reason I do it is I want, now it's time for me to give back, right? Yeah. I can, I know a lot more than I did 25 years ago. And why watch someone make the same stupid mistakes when I can teach them, right? So that's the first Amen. reason. The other reason is, as this, now this is more of an, a global thing. As this private investment world continues to develop, if the people that are brought into it, the investors that are brought into it are brought in with inexperienced people who then have a bad experience for those investors, they don't have distributions, they're getting capital calls. So that actually hurts the entire system. The pool dries up. And that's kind of where we're at right now. There's a lot of people that have a bad taste of yeah. syndication in their mouth because of what happened in the you know, everybody was doing bridge notes, uh, yeah. myself included. I've got a couple of bridge notes that I finally got out of, but... Lord, it was a uh, it was a brutal couple of years, and I think there's a lot of people that are like, I'm not sure if this was the right vehicle. Well, right? and that and right, so now it affects my ability to raise money. It it actually is interesting though when I talk to investors that have gone through that, 
they do see the difference now, right? They didn't understand yes. it before, but they see it now. Yeah. But what's important, I believe that if I can teach new people the right way to do this, yeah, the right way to really underwrite, to know when you're overpaying and when you're not, and and you know, show them how to do the work, that I feel like it's gonna be for the whole system, it will be better. Yes. Because I do believe there is way more wealth to be built in this private uh, equity real estate world than I than you can make in the stock market. I mean, yeah. I, I just I, I can't even deal without with without a doubt, right? Like, yeah, I used to be my past life was a financial advisor, and oh, really? so yeah, was stocks, bonds, mutual funds, all of it. And I, and when the market crashed in two thousand and nine, I I remember uh, you know all my investors. I had this one guy retired from Intel. He had like four million bucks, and then you know one year later he had two million. And mm -hmm. I looked at him and said, "Well, it's the market." And that was my only thing I could say. Yeah, I know. And you I like know. what? And you know, you felt helpless. And there's no levers, right? No. Like with real estate, this is what I love about it: is there's levers we have. We can, we can tighten the belt. We can let go of some staff. We can, um, you know, we can renegotiate with the bank. There's so many other things to do to get right. through a portion of a, of a bad period than just to say. Well, right. guess what? We're done. Yeah, at at the base of the foundation of my business plan is multifamily because I can't figure out how to make that go away. Yeah. We can we can have economic challenges, we can have a lot of things, but as long as we have people, people need a place to live. It's not like office or retail or medical or storage. See, I can I can make cases for those struggling. Yeah. How do, how does multifamily go away? I can't figure that out. I don't think and that's why I'm will. there. So yep. what we've tried to do is mitigate all these risks over the years, right? Is I went through the 08 financial crisis just like you did. Yep. I owned and managed a lot of property during that time. Never lost a dime. But we learned massively valuable lessons during that time that For we sure, should right? apply today. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I had rental I always had single family rentals and I still own them because I was in it for the long game. I wasn't playing a yeah. short game and my loan wasn't due. So I was like, just continue to operate them, keep them full. You yep. do that. Like it was only people that had these short term. And really that's, the, I think the biggest difference between multifamily and single family guys. Right. Yeah. Uh, most multifamily people that I, that I think are doing the business, if they're doing it right, they have, we should have longer term vision. Yes. Long-term vision is what, what wins this race. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's not like a year. That's not it. It's like five to seven. <laughs> yeah, years. Five, yeah, three, five, seven years. We try yeah. to turn in three to five years, but we can't hold longer if we need. Yeah, to. you know, it just and, and but like after that's enough time. That's a good amount of time for a season mm -hmm. to 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 weather some mm -hmm. to weather COVID. COVID was two years. That's right. You know? And so that's the beauty of this vehicle is that it doesn't go away. And like you said, uh, we can stay resilient all the way through as long as our fundamentals are right. Yeah, as long as you don't lose your property, you can weather the storm, yeah. come out, and eventually people are going to still need a place to live. I mean, that's not going to go away. Yeah. So it'll come back. Well, that's why awesome. I like it. Well, as we wrap up, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing some of this uh, amazing wealth and knowledge. And uh, to understand that, you know, Gosh, playing the game for 25 years, right? You don't see a lot of people um, that have played real estate that long. They've not been playing Monopoly that long, right? And to <laughs> and to do it and still be as passionate as today as you were when you, I can tell, like you're still as passionate now oh, as you were back then when you first started, yeah. right? Yeah, I love it. And then and now that the decision to give back, right? To create a platform for people to learn and earn, um, that is actually one of the greatest gifts, I think, that as you as you go down that journey you'll find that that's that is the most rewarding gift is having someone it say is. you changed my life uh you're right it has already happened and i i will tell you five or six years ago i would not i i didn't understand that but all you have to do is change a few people's lives to realize wait a minute wait a minute i'm going to be gone someday and these people are going to be different people because of what you've done, right? Yeah, that, I mean, one, that, that, that one guy or whatever that person is, I, I'm sure that if you were like to put them on the put them on the spot and they'll they'll break down and cry. Yeah, like, I, I know my guy will. I, I got one guy that I know. If I called him up right now, David Rosenbaum, and I'd be like, "Hey, how's life, bro? You know, yeah. how did?" And then yeah. he'd just like, "Dude, that you was the it. one thing. It was the one I just get. He was he did the work, but you know, it's like 
Candace, like you said, you have these certain things that we've acquired over a period of time. And when you just give and you just nudge someone and the right person that you nudge them the right way and they get it, God, it's like the best feeling in the world. Yeah, because you are where they want to go and they can't see themselves being where you are. And sometimes so you, you got to give them, them a little bit of belief. Yeah, you give them a little bit of your belief, Ken, and all of a sudden to watch them take off. It, yeah, is, awesome, it, isn't it is by far the best, right? It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, look, I can tell by your smile, you do enjoy it. Oh, yeah. As oh, much as I do, I can yeah, tell. Yeah, this is, I mean, I love it. Like, I'm, someone asked me the same thing, like, Corey, when are you going to quit? Never. This I'll, doesn't work. This is I'll fun. die. <laughs> That's when I quit, because I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and and so that's the beauty of this game when you're done it right. And I think Ken, Ken, you're displaying this uh, with, with spades is that the journey is the reward. Yeah, that's really not about money anymore. Is it about money for you anymore? No, no, I'm good. Yeah, we lost that loss that loses all its affinity real quick. That's a weird thing for people listening right now to hear this. Ken just said it. <laughs> it's not important. It's weird. Right. Say I, like I do that, enjoy right? making more money. All right. Don't, don't, don't misquote me. Hey, we but, keep track, <laughs> but it is not. Yeah, it is important, but I don't, I, I'm not worried now. I don't have to go to the grocery store and, and worry about, am I getting the organic version versus the non-organic? I, Someone I don't have to said, Hey, how much does it cost to fill up your truck? I don't even know. I don't know. I was like, I don't know. Right. I'm, I mean, I, and that's an honest answer. Yeah, I don't know. It was know, a time I, when I did go. I'm going to get five dollars worth of gas. I lived through those times. Those yeah, are tough. I did those too. Are tough, and yeah. you don't have to live through those times if you just uh, do all the right things. You can you, you can get through those. One or two deals. Do what Ken talks about, right? Do one or two deals and and do it his way, and you'll be amazed. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of properties to set your life pretty straight pretty fast. Right? Yes. Yes. It's a beautiful thing. Ken, if people want to find out more about your company and your process, where do they find you at? Yeah, it's easy. KRIpartners.com. So KRIpartners.com. And uh, if the if they're in the video version, just hit my QR code over my shoulder and uh, it'll take you there. But yep, KRIpartners.com. as we're doing. I actually just, I took my phone and then- and, 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 Did you? And, and, yeah, I did. I was like, <laughs> I wanted, I was like, that's pretty smart, right? I was like, I might need to get a background. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, we we just redid our website, and uh, well, you'll see when when you go there. Um, if you go to kripartners.com, if you're the kind of person who wants to be a passive investor, we can help you. If you're the person who wants to learn how to do your own deals, we can help you. What does KRI stand for? Well, I would tell you that now it it really doesn't have a lot of meaning. But when I vi started this business, uh, probably in '95 or something like that, when I was you know was still a brain child, I thought. All right, myself and my brother-in-law, my then brother-in-law, Robert, was going to buy a building and it would be our retirement. So it was Ken's and Robert's investments. Six months in, Robert said, man, I need out. I said, why do you need out? He goes, because I got to do my driveway. I said, really? I'm like, oh, me, seriously? He said, yep. I said, all right, you're out. But then <laughs> here's the funny part. I had already committed so much time, energy, and money to developing my name and logo which is ridiculous now that I look at it, but I decided to keep the KRI and it's been that way ever since. So love it. Great story. Great, <laughs> great story. The truth. That's how. That's it really always is. the best ones, man. <laughs> uh, any books that you've been reading lately that has really turned the needle for you that you'd like to share on this podcast? Yeah. I mean, I, I am an avid reader. I read everything that I can um, on the marketing side. I read a whole bunch of Russell Brownson stuff, Cardone's 10 X rule. Or 10x, something like that. I think it's 10x rule. I mean, that just speaks to how you need to just function in life. And uh, I don't know, probably another one would be Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of yeah. Highly Effective People. I and mean, there's so many good, good books out there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, readers are leaders. And uh, guys, if you're not reading books uh, at, at a pretty good pace, you'd be surprised what you're missing because there's so yeah. much knowledge and sometimes it's about the journey that the book takes you on in your mm -hmm. mind it's not so much like it it's not like oh i need exactly a how-to it's a really a, a, sometimes we got to go on journeys with our minds and, and allow it to open up and unlearn what you've learned like a little bit of yoda on you right so you can open up a, a highway of some new information that yeah. could maybe change your life and it will. Yeah, I, I just wish I would. I will be honest. I wish that I would have gotten out of my own way earlier. Yeah. I didn't read enough of this stuff early on, to your point. 
And so I think people are where they are because they choose to be there, but they don't realize they've chosen to be there. They just, they can't see themselves being something different, or it actually is scary for them to do that. And when you continue to read about these people doing crazy things, you're like, wait a minute. Eventually you realize they, they they're no different than you are. Can have you written a book yet? Pardon? Have you written a book yet? Have I written a book? I yeah. have. Yeah, I have. I have a multifamily real estate. It's a total game changer book. Um, we're going to rewrite it because I just continue to evolve. Okay, I can't want to make sure. I, I, like, I feel like you should. Like if you've not, I feel like you should. Like that's... oh, it's on the list. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of books on my list here. Right. Um, but right now we're in the process of really developing that comprehensive. We call it our advanced acquisition multifamily acquisition program. Yeah. It is the one that will take you from, you really don't have a clue all the way to closing. And you and I know there's so many little intricacies that you just don't understand until somebody leads you through this process by the hand. And when they do, all I need to do is teach them how to do their first deal and their life will change. And then they're off. They're off. Yeah, you don't need to do it. We are devoting a lot of time and energy to that right now because I know that we can have a lot of impact with that that program. Awesome. Any last words of wisdom that you'd love to give and and to anybody that's new or somewhat somewhat starting out in the game of multifamily? What would you tell them? Yeah, learn. Learn, get into the details. Don't let anybody convince you it's not about the details because it is. There's a lot of people out there doing that, you know, thinking that you don't, and it's a business. Apartments are businesses. Nobody else would start a business thinking that they don't need to understand it, right? You need to understand it, get into the details. And if you do, here's why I I say this. I watch people try to do this business, but they don't want to dive into the details. And when they start down that road, they realize somebody's going to ask them a question, an investor, a lender, a broker, anybody, and they can't answer it because they didn't go into the details. They don't know why things are the way they are. And that's why I want people to do that work because once you understand why, it's it's easy. It, it act, I mean, this isn't rocket science to what we do. It's just taking the time to understand why we do things the way we do them. And then once you understand that, now your confidence level goes through the roof. You're smiling again. Your confidence goes through the roof and now you can move forward with some certainty and intentionality that you didn't have before because you knew in the back of your mind, man, I don't really understand this. I'm, I think they, I think it's called impost, uh, imposter syndrome, where yeah. you know you're not what you're pretending to be. But if I teach you all the details, you learn all those details. There's, there's no imposter about it. No, you understand. It's confidence too. Confidence leads to that. Then you're like, I can take Knowledge massive action. Builds confidence. That's yeah. exactly right. I can talk to any group of people I want if I know what I'm talking about. Yep. I don't know what I'm talking about. It is hard for me to talk to two people at one time. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Ken, I want to thank you for these wonderful words of wisdom and just your attitude in general. Guys, if you listen to this podcast, this is what we try to do. We try to bring in guests just like Ken that uh, seasoned, doing it, made some mistakes, uh, gotten dirty, but living his best life. You can tell by, if you're watching the video right now, uh, Ken's smiling. Ken has, has, has figured it out and he's helping teach others. Ken, what's the website again? They got to go to your... Yeah, kripartners.com. Right? Go to that website. Go check out his stuff uh, because I'm telling you, it takes one deal, guys. One deal in this multifamily game can change your life forever. Uh, Guys, if you believe it, you can achieve it and your paradise is possible.